This week on The Anxious Truth, we're talking about consuming social media content related to anxiety and mental health, and specifically content that might be off the mark, maybe not so helpful or even dangerous. So let's get at it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 298 of the podcast. We are recording in July of 2024. In case you are listening from the future, this is the podcast where we talk about all things anxiety, anxiety recovery, and anxiety disorders. So if you're struggling with things like OCD or panic disorder or agoraphobia or health anxiety, well, this is the place for you. If you're new to the podcast or the YouTube channel and you just sort of accidentally found us today, welcome. I hope you find it helpful. And if you are a returning listener or viewer, Welcome back. I'm glad that you are here. I'm Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. I'm an anxiety therapist practicing under supervision, specializing in the treatment of anxiety and anxiety disorders in New York. I'm also a three-time author on the topic of anxiety and anxiety recovery, social media guy, advocate, psychoeducator, and a former sufferer of various anxiety disorders, OCD, and depression for many years of my life, on and off, but thankfully doing quite well now. So today we're going to talk about the idea that the content that you consume or, or is pushed at you on social media when it comes to anxiety and uh, mental health can sometimes be off the mark, can sometimes be less than helpful, can sometimes steer you in the wrong direction, can sometimes be sort of misguided or misapplied, and even sometimes can be actually harmful. I have a special guest with me today, Emma McAdam. Emma is the host of the Therapy in a Nutshell YouTube channel. Uh, Emma and I connected a few months ago and she asked me to be on her YouTube channel. We hit it off. I really like talking to her. I asked her to come on because this is definitely one of those topics that she's interested in. And I think she's an excellent source uh, and an excellent person to talk about this topic with. So she's going to come on in a second. Um, but before we get to Emma and today's topic, just a quick reminder that there are way more resources than just this video or this podcast episode. You can find all of them on my website. That's theanxioustruth.com. If you want more on these topics, we the more podcast episodes, more videos, books, workshops free social media content, whatever it happens to be, go check out my website. It's on the anxious truth.com. Everything that you might want to find is going to be over there. So go check that out. So Emma McAdam is the host of the therapy in a nutshell, uh, YouTube channel. It's a big mental health channel and Emma produces excellent content. She's an excellent psychoeducator. She brings a very well-rounded point of view. She clearly states her beliefs and, and therapeutic uh, and theoretical orientations in her, uh, videos, which is great. So she's super transparent but she's also open to talking about a lot of different theories and a lot of different modalities and a lot of different viewpoints and opinions and emerging information and new treatment types in the therapy world. So I really respect Emma. She's grown her channel to a very large audience and deservedly so. She deserves all the attention that she gets. Uh, she invited me to be on one of her YouTube lives a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. We hit it off. I invited her to come on today. If you want to find more about Emma, I will have her information in the podcast show notes or the YouTube uh, video description, so you can check that out. But you can always find all of her stuff at therapyinanutshell.com. And by the way, Emma is a practicing license, uh, a practicing marriage and family therapist in the state of Utah. She's out in the great West here in the US in just a lovely part of the country that I am jealous of. Let's get her on right now. We're going to talk about... Uh, questionable, sometimes harmful social media content related to anxiety and mental health. Let's get to it right now. Emma, welcome to the podcast. Hey, I'm so happy to be here, Drew. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for having me on your YouTube channel and, and now coming back to uh, hang out with me for a little while. Yeah, I loved chatting. I loved chatting. And um, I was talking to an OCD expert later and she's, I said, you should, you should watch my episode with Drew. And she said, she watched it. She's like, oh yeah, he had such good things to say. So I'm like, all right, let's go. Yeah. Yay. Well, I appreciate that. He had such good things to say because today's topic, as you guys heard in the intro, is I'm going to call it questionable mental health advice. We don't have to stick to anxiety. We could talk about anything. That's mm -hmm. the beauty of like Emma is not just an anxiety expert. So that's great. We'll broaden our horizons here. And I've seen you produce content along these lines, which I think is how I first found you. It was like a fist bump oh. moment. Like, yes. <laughs> really? Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I think you were, I, I'm going to say it might've been an Instagram reel or something that I stumbled upon where you were talking about the use of therapy speak. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And that's gotten so popular over the last couple of years. So I don't know what do you, overall, let me, you know what? No pressure. What are your thoughts on bad health advice, Em? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I just recently saw a study, a big study they did of, of um, they took 500 mental health videos off of TikTok, they analyzed them, found that 84% of them 
uh, contained misleading advice. And I don't remember the exact number, but a big percentage of them contained harmful advice. And uh, that these 500 videos have been viewed 24 million times. And uh, the, the, the areas that are most common to include misleading and harmful advice were ADHD, depression, and bipolar disorder. Uh, man, so many people are getting a lot of education, education from um, the internet, which is what we do, right? We're trying to be part of the scene. Yeah. Well, also, like, it's, it can be hard to catch it when something you've been told from someone who seems like they know what they're talking about um, might be misleading. Yeah. It's interesting that the first, and I don't know what the order was. I haven't seen the study, so I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it's interesting that the first thing on that list was ADHD because, oh, yeah. you know, here, and here's one thing that I have a problem with in terms of mental health advice on the internet. Like, you know, it's really good that we're talking about ADHD more and we're, we're recognizing mm -hmm. the neurodivergent community. That's super important because we didn't for a really long time like, right. we medicalize the way their brains work. And like, that's not cool. Yeah. Yeah. And now I cannot believe the number of people in my social media feed that are suddenly ADHD experts. Right. So one of the things that happens all <sighs> is that when, when that becomes a, a hot topic, then people who are in the business of trying to get your attention will jump on it, whether they should or shouldn't. They, they, this is trending, so I'm going to talk about it. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things, that's one of the really interesting things about social media. And I think people understand there's an algorithm and there's, there's um, stuff that gets promoted and stuff that goes viral, but it's really interesting. Whenever I make a video that's like, Hey, let's talk about what diagnoses really mean mm -hmm. and how to use a diagnostic label more accurately, which from my perspective is when you have the symptoms, you qualify for a diagnosis. When you have the clinical symptoms, you qualify for that diagnosis. But when you are in recovery, when you, um, make improvements or you um, get treatment and you no longer have those symptoms, you no longer meet the criteria for that diagnosis. And I'm specifically talking about like, you know, anxiety, sure. depression, but um, I think a lot of people misunderstand diagnoses and think, oh, if you have this, um, if you have depression, that means that you have depression forever and yeah. it's who you are. And I, whenever I make videos about this, they never perform very well. They're just not very popular. <laughs> um, they just, and and it's crazy to me, but if, which I really don't make videos that are like, let me give you five signs that you have this problem. I literally do not make videos like that. Um, but when you make video, when people make videos like that, they tend to perform very well because it's very comforting for people to get an explanation for why am I the way I am? And please tell me it's not, it's not maybe my fault because that's kind of comforting sure. or like it's a, a a permanent situation. Now, I do think diagnoses are, can be very beneficial and can be helpful in mm -hmm. getting, you know, treatment, education, using common language around a term. But um, in general, when I try to make a nuanced argument for how to use diagnoses the proper way, people are just like, I don't, I'm not really interested. Yeah, I, I have found the same thing. Now, Emma is, if you guys didn't know Emma, go over to therapy in a nutshell.com. You're primarily in the YouTube space. So that's where okay. your, your sort of bread and butter is, whereas most of my traction is here on the podcast. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a YouTube video or a podcast, when mm -hmm. you're trying to explain somewhat complicated or nuanced topics, I'm not, you know, I, I know people want to hear these things, but it's much easier to consume, you know, my therapist gave me these five signs that I have high functioning anxiety. Yeah, it's much easier to consume. And you're right, those things do much, much, much better, which I think leads us to, you know, if you're going to be an educated consumer of mental health information online, the source matters. And sometimes we can get confused because, well, since this person has 17 million followers mm -hmm. and has written three best selling books on, I don't know what, that yeah. they can, they should be giving me. Like, did you hear what this guy said about mental health or whatever right. it happens to be, or this person said? And then it becomes almost fact because a, a big voice said it. Mm -hmm. it and, right. And I, th I think the stuff that really performs best, the stuff that goes most viral tends to be the stuff that is, uh, seems really, it resonates in a strangely comforting way, but isn't necessarily like, hey, guess what? If you do some work, if you do some hard stuff, your life might get better. It's like, you look at, pol you look at politics and if any politician says, do you want your taxes lower? And everyone's like, yes, we yes. do. Do you want all these magical services? Yes, we do. Like in the high school, um, like a high school campaign, <laughs> we're going to give you free vending machines. Yes, we want that. And then it's like, um, but do you know that like, actually you could, 
you could solve some of your problems by working a little differently or organizing your time better. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's not a good political. Oh, click. I'm done. Yeah. I mean, let me go on to something else. I, yeah. I don't think that's anybody's fault. I mean, listen, we're all wired for the path. of. I am. I, I'm yeah. sure we all are. We're all wired for the path of the least resistance. I kind of get that. Yeah. But I, I, I agree with you. It sounds, and, and sometimes it's not actionable information. Like, it's yeah. fine to be educated and learn about the nature of whatever it is you're struggling with. That's in fact, that's probably phase one in, in the therapy process, really, you yeah. know, psychoeducation, but like, okay, cool. So after you've heard 68 times in the last six months, what anxiety feels like, or what a panic attack feels like now, now what are you going to do about that? And what it feels mm -hmm. like is really popular content. What are you going to do about that? At least in my little niche of anxiety disorders, not popular. People say like, how do you not have a million subscribers on your YouTube? Well, I don't really talk about popular things. Nobody yeah. wants to hear, go do scary shit. They want yeah. to like, here's the top five reasons why, you know, anxiety isn't your fault, which it isn't, mm -hmm. but okay, now what? One of those videos would go viral. Yeah, the exposure therapy video would not. And yeah. and I don't, I'm not saying this from like, oh my gosh, everyone out there is bad. Cause I also am the same way like i like to think about it i like mm -hmm. to analyze things and i like to kind of conceptualize and make a list of like how this works and why this works but then i catch myself sometimes um drowning in a little bit of anxiety i was telling you just before this like a little bit of burnout right now and it's like i have to remind myself to go back to like actionable steps like i'm like okay so i'm really struggling with anxiety i know a ton about anxiety and i'm feeling really anxious which means i need to go back to taking action so it's like okay I'm going to simplify my calendar. I'm going to spend a little bit more time exercising. I'm going to make sure and solve some problems that I've perhaps been avoiding. I'm going to take time to write in my journal instead of watching my, my phone. And that stuff's like so much harder to do than be like, let's watch a video on like what part of your brain isn't working right now. I'm like, that sounds fun. Let's do that. I so feel that. And you know, I don't think it's, this is not related to mental health, by the way. It's not just in mental health. It's in anything. Sure. So like one of the things I've been meaning to do for a really long time as I'm vulnerable too, is I want to get my scuba certification. Right. Oh, so, yeah. you cool. know, I've been looking into that more and I was going to do it before pre pandemic and that sort of, you know, got derailed. I'm like, no, I'm definitely doing it this winter for sure. I, I really want to get that done. Cool. So, you know, all right, let me do a little research. And I am drawn immediately to the like top 10 tips for beginning scuba divers. Like mm -hmm. I can watch a three hour video where a guy goes through the paddy course or I could do top 10 tips for new divers. Yeah. I'm gonna watch the top 10 tips. Sorry, I'm gonna do it. So we're all kind of wired that way. It's just yeah. it. You have, it's, sometimes you have to be careful about what you consume and how you kind of incorporate that. One of the things that's been getting me a little bit, I'll throw it out there and maybe have an opinion, maybe don't, is the use of things like therapy speak, yeah, but also the advocation of the nuclear option. So we're going outside oh, anxiety yeah. disorders now, right? Uh, yeah, I can see mm -hmm. Evan's face. If you're not watching on the video, you can see the expression. But um, the nuclear option when it comes to problems that are maybe interpersonal in nature, you know, yeah. maybe you had a, you've had a difficult time with a, a friend or a partner or your parents or whatever, and that happens, and we mm -hmm. do have to protect ourselves. Nobody's saying not to do that, yeah. but the most popular information that I see started to get dropped, especially in the last year and a half is that whole boundaries word, which often becomes cut them off, cut them off, yeah, really cut them off. Like so you go to but from a from a mental health standpoint, that would be the last option. That's the nuclear option. Sometimes you got to do it. That's true. Mm -hmm. But social media would have you believe, for instance, if you're having interpersonal problems, cut them off, yeah. call them an abuser automatically. Mm -hmm. And now call yourself too much and yeah, I'm too much for you. You just can't handle me. So I have to cut you off. I'm yeah. not saying that can't be true. Sometimes it is, but that mm -hmm. cannot be the only solution to interpersonal problems. Well, it's so, it's so interesting. I, I've been thinking a lot about this and New York Times just wrote an article about estrangement, but there, this happens from both directions where people are getting told, mm -hmm. um, well, one, one of the most common things is people are getting told that their partner or someone is, or their parent is a narcissist. Right. And um, so I've got a I've got a buddy who does who who runs a couple marriage therapy clinics. He's got about twenty therapists who work under him. He's one of the most brilliant therapists I've worked with. And he says about forty five percent of people coming into marriage therapy, ha one of them has been told by either they either believe from what they've seen on the internet or by their friends that their partner is a narcissist. Um, now narcissism, the prevalence of clinical narcissistic personality disorder is between 0.5 and two percent. Yeah, it's low. So we're seeing 45% of people labeling their partner with, when you look at personality disorders, a relatively permanent 
con pervasive mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so why would we be seeing suddenly go from 0.5 to 2% to 45% of people? Now, obviously people in marriage therapy, that's a select uh, population. True. But what's going on is we're taking traits and it's like, yes, some people do have narcissistic traits. Sometimes people are abusive and I'm not condoning abuse under any condition. Yep. Um, sometimes people are selfish or rude or they'll gaslight you, but people can have traits of a condition and that does not mean they meet the full criteria for that condition. And we'll see the same thing with ADHD, right? You could like, if you asked the entire population of the United States, okay, wh who has a hard time with procrastination? They don't like doing tasks that are difficult. You have a hard time paying attention to things that are boring. Mm -hmm. um, you sometimes feel too much energy and sometimes feel unmotivated. And you could ask the general population and that would probably be like 80, 85% of people at some point in their lives or more experience those <laughs> things. I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, and so it's, it's normal to have those traits and it's different to have them to a pervasive manner that impacts your functioning, that shows up in these specific patterns that you actually meet the criteria for a full, full diagnosis. So going back to what you were saying, I think a lot of people, they'll see these videos, very popular videos, or they'll be told by their friends, um, hey, your, your partner has these red flags or your parents have these red flags, mm -hmm. but then they don't have the skills and tools to do much with that. They don't know like, oh my gosh, there are 500 interventions you can do in a relationship. There's 500 ways you can shift your half of this relationship mm -hmm. that's gonna shift the other half of the relationship. And I'm a marriage and family therapist, so I get like schemed about this. Ooh, I, saw, okay. right. I, saw, <laughs> I saw a video on TikTok, no, on Instagram, I don't use TikTok. Um, and it was a therapist, a licensed uh, an LPC. So they're trained in individual therapy. Sure. And he said, here are the six stages of therapy. You come in, you say, here's my problem. And then he says, step two is identifying how your parents gave you that problem by their behaviors. Step three is identifying how that's showing up in your life. Step four is um, healing yourself. And then step five is like considering what role you might have in the problem. And step six is like, you know, creating a new life. Yeah. based on the kind of person you want to be. And I said, are you kidding me? Step two is it's always your parents' fault? <laughs> Who's tech, whose account is that? Sigmund Freud? <laughs> that's that's a good question. The animated Sigmund Freud? And I was like, there. I, I think there might be a little bit of transference going on here. Like this therapist's wow. parents, or yeah. he believes his parents, and I'm not going to say they weren't. I'm not going to say people's parents aren't messed up because parents do like hurt their oh, yeah, kids. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, but his default assumption was, it's going to be your parents' fault once we get to step two. Oh, let's just, why, why not just go right to step two? Hell. Yeah, but he's an individual therapist. And so here's the other thing that gets me steamed up, and I will get off my soapbox in just one second. You know um, okay. <laughs> so I pulled my audience yesterday. I said, how many of you have been told by a therapist to cut someone off? And 20% of, and, and, um, and I put yes, no, or it's complicated. 20% yeah. um, of them said yes. 17% of them said it's complicated. And um, the other 60% said, 60 something percent said, no, that hasn't happened. And then down in the comments, people got more nuanced. Yeah. But I think when you look at it, a lot of them said, oh, my therapist never told me to cut someone off. They helped me consider my relationships. They helped me walk through them. Okay. They helped me try different options. They helped me consider boundaries. They helped me yeah. talk, like change my communication styles. They helped me be more assertive. And then, um, you know, other people said they did. They told me to cut them off and I'm so glad I did. But I think we're seeing this trend toward the nuclear option. And and therapists, a good therapist is not going to tell their client to do anything. They're no, going to suggest and present yeah. and, say, and help people see things. Yeah, right? I can't. I, I, that blows me away. That 20% mm -hmm. said, no, they, my therapist said cut that person off. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a tough one, man. That's, a, that's really a tough one. You know, that, that speaks also to just a very quick offshoot, the whole, my therapist told me posts mm -hmm. love those two. Cause I'm yeah. like, all right, I might be the new guy on the block. I mean, you've been practicing for 20 years. I'm the new guy, but like, I'm pretty sure that no therapists are saying this or if they are, who the hell are they? Like my I therapist know. told me like, I, you know, and again, you gotta be careful about that because that is designed. That's an appeal to authority. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that my therapist said this and I'm going to say some sort of like, maybe it's useful. Maybe it's not so much. Maybe it's harmful. But that looks right. It sure looks right. There's, there's so many interesting dynamics going on there. And I could talk about this 
for so long. I mean, I had a I had a roommate once who was a very difficult roommate. She was very difficult to live with. Mm. And she was very opinionated and everyone needed to do things a certain way. And she was very critical. And she went to therapy and came back and said, hey, Emma, just so you know, my therapist says I need to be more assertive. So you're going to see me and Cherie fighting a lot more. But that's because that's what my therapist told me to do. And I thought in my head, okay, the therapist either <laughs> maybe didn't say it like that or the therapist is just seeing a very small window here oh. and um, isn't getting the full picture. And so when I look at this, like, oh, the nuclear option, let's cut people off. Let's let's boundary them to death or whatever. I actually love boundaries. I think good, healthy boundaries are awesome. Sure. Um, but I think a family therapist would look at a situation and say, can we invite this person to therapy? Can we um, encourage a conversation to happen? Can we shift the dynamic? And they might try, you know, or suggest or explore, I believe a couple hundred treatment options when it comes to relationships. Yeah. Um, and cutting someone off is kind of a nuclear option. I think there's a, there's a place for it. Well, <laughs> like it's sadly, unfor unfortunately, yeah. it's sad, but there is a place for it. You're right. And, you know, like, look, full disclaimer, I know Emma would get on to this. Like, if you are in an abusive situation, a truly yeah. abusive, yeah, you got to get safe. There's no doubt about that, right? But yeah. what's interesting about that is even, like, in my training, again, new guy in the block, it's crazy because technically, I would not even tell you to leave. That's not right. my job to tell you to leave mm -hmm. that abusive relationship. I would certainly support you, help you make the plan, help yeah. you explore that option. But it's still not your therapist's job to tell you what to do. And, 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 you know, mm -hmm. That gets a little dangerous, I think, you know, tell you what to do. I, I would absolutely agree with you. I think it's unethical for I, therapists to make decisions for their clients. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few situations where we obviously get very involved, including like when kids are being abused, we're calling the authorities. When adults um, who are incapacitated are being abused, when people are at danger of sexually transmitted diseases that they don't know about. I mean, we've got about five situations where we're going to step in and be like, okay, we're calling the authorities and we're going to let CCFS or CFS, um, you know, make some decisions here. But I mean, I had a client who had been um, abused by her stepdad uh, for five or six years, sexually abused. And she came in and she still wanted a relationship with him because he was the most supportive person in her life. She was like 19, right? She just left home okay. and was still kind of coming to understand like that this actually was abuse. It was kind of complicated and these situations are. And I did not go and be like, oh my gosh, you have to report him. You have to do this. You have to do this. This is terrible. I said, okay, let's talk through this. Let's look at this. Yeah. And um, in the end, she decided she, after about a year of therapy, decided she wanted no contact with him. Mm -hmm. And then another four or five months decided she wanted to make a report. And then that was a two year process of going through trials that she had personally chosen to take that path instead of me being like, you need to do this and this. And then me throwing her into a situation where um, me throwing her into a situation that she would have been like kind of drowning in, in the first year out of her home. Anyway, yeah. I think, I think clients need to be respected to, to make their own choices. And I think as we are consumers of social media, we have to be really careful to be really intentional about like, what do we want our lives to be about mm -hmm. and who do I want to inform me as I make my life choices? Yeah. Um, because otherwise the algorithm is going to make some decisions for you. The yeah. algorithm is going to decide to tell you things. Yeah, that's a hundred percent right. And the algorithm is so sensitive. Just scroll mm -hmm. down for half a second, slow down on, for a half a second on that reel. Mm -hmm. And it knows, and it thinks that I need to see more of that. And it's going to mm -hmm. show more of that. So that's a great story. I mean, that's not necessarily, surely not a good story for your client, but yeah. The fact that look how long it took her to come to very complicated, impactful decisions, as opposed to scrolling through your feed and having see again and again and again, cut them off nuclear option, you know, they're, everybody's a narcissist, everybody that disagrees with you is gaslighting you. Like yeah. it's life is usually not that that cut and dry. So that's kind of tough, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it could be a little bit dangerous, I think. I, I think so, too. Yeah. And I think it's to be wise consumers, we have to limit our amount. Uh, we have to we have to limit yeah. what we use. We have to choose who we listen to. And if you if you aren't aware of this, like what you watch more of, what you type, what you engage with longer, that's what the internet is going to show you more of. Yeah. So, like, 
my Instagram feed, I know the algorithm and I carefully tailored it to always swipe away on everything that's, that's not funny. And the only thing I look at on Instagram is funny stuff. And I choose that Instagram is not my source of news or education. Oh. But then when I choose my news and education, I've chosen four sources that have a spectrum from the right to the left mm -hmm. so that I can gain a little bit of perspective from each. And I subscribe to a couple of newsletters that provide provide education from different angles mm -hmm. so that I don't get stuck in the echo chamber. And I try yep. to, you know, try to consult other therapists as well, because I, I don't necessarily believe that I have all the right answers. And I hope people who watch my channel understand that I'm actually wrong about certain things. Oh. And when I do find out, I try and tell people I was wrong about that. Let me come back. <laughs> Wait, I saw an influencer that said she was wrong. I don't believe it. I, I, you don't seem like an influencer. You have a big channel, but I would not apply that. You, you don't, you're not in that mold. And I appreciate that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. You would be, so you're like Meta's worst nightmare. You're an educated, <laughs> limited consumer of social media. So, oh, man. Yeah. Sometimes Meta, Meta still sucks me in, you know, they're so good at it. I clicked on one inspirational quote um, from uh -huh. Victor Frankl on my Facebook feed, and then I got 45 like inspirational <laughs> quotes from other people. I was like, oh it's my gosh, go away. Uh, I used to see that in Facebook too, I, and I rarely, I maybe I log into Facebook once a week at this point. Yeah. But it would be like, oh, hey, there's my friend Emma, or here's, I, I, I barely see Emma, let me like that picture. And now here's everything Emma has ever posted since 2008. Because since oh. you clearly like that picture, here's all of her stuff. Like it's Poor Facebook. They're getting weird so desperate. <laughs> I know. It's kind of weird. But uh, I think that's kind of tough. The only other thing that I want to talk about a little bit, and you say consider the source. And mm -hmm. when it comes to mental health, I, I think one of the things that I have been fascinated to see in my very young practice here is the bleed through between and it's good that we have so much information, right? Like that's, that's a good thing. Cause we, when I first started having panic attacks, I go to the damn library, like mm -hmm. I was written on rocks. It was really, it was a long time ago, right? <laughs> so it was not good. So it's good that we have all that now, but I'm surprised of the bleed through that I see in, I, I want to be really careful cause I don't want to pick on anybody here, which I usually do anyway, but like the entrepreneur culture, hustle culture, life hacker culture, the bleed through into swear to God, really debilitating mental health conditions has been a little alarming to me. Yeah. Like, oh, we got to talk about that. And now if you're going to sit in a room with me and in, in the therapy room with me, now I'm probably because I'm an advocate for you and I'm going to try and help you make good decisions. I will probably issue a bit of a challenge CBT style on like that information. You know, what, what is that information helping you when yeah. a guy whose business is really like business is now decided that it's a good idea to start talking about ADHD and anxiety? Is that, yeah. how is that helping you? If it's helping you, cool, I support it. But is it, you know, so mm -hmm. the bleed through is really difficult, I think. It's so interesting. And mental health is now like such a pillar of what's important to people. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see people who perhaps have an idea about a topic, but maybe not the full context. Mm -hmm or a process. So one of the things about, I would say a good therapist, and this is my definition, there's other definitions out there, but my opinion is a therapist should be a process consultant. We help people build a process where I, I consult people on the process of deciding what they want their life to be about. Like I help them gain a vision for what they want and help them break through some patterns so that they can make their own decisions in their own life in the best possible way with the information that's going to be helpful. Now that's, that's a little different than what I do on YouTube where I'm an educator, right. but in, in the therapy room, I help people build a process where they make their own choices based on their values, what they want their life to be about. Yeah. And um, that's very different from giving advice. And I educate on YouTube, but in therapy, I don't give advice. And you look at coaches and a coach gives a lot of advice. So I was, I was interacting with someone who I respect a ton. She does a lot of work around trauma. She has a personal experience with trauma, but she's not trained as a therapist. Mm -hmm. And people ask her a question and she's like, oh, here's what you should do. Here's what you yeah. should do. Yeah. You should leave this person. And, or you should uh, take this, take this life changing decision or you should do this. And when people are giving a lot of advice, I get a little nervous because I'm like, you just took responsibility for someone else's life. Yeah. yeah. And that person is giving you responsibility for their life and their outcomes. And I think um, a good therapist or good psychologist is going to help people gain the resources and skills so that they can make the choices around their life that they value, that they're invested in, so that they can 
live the life they dream of instead of and have full responsibility for their own lives. And that's a tough situation too, because there's so much that has gone into your life. Right, who are you, listener of the podcast, watcher of the YouTube video, mm -hmm. your life has so much in it mm -hmm. that it's really difficult. And you know, I'll echo that a little bit. Like a, it, as a therapist, I'm going to take a long time to help you put all of those pieces into this context because there's so many freaking pieces, right? Right. And, yeah. and things that are as mechanical as things like agoraphobia, and you know, yeah, guys like me were the engineers of therapy. I get it. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, it's all right. But even then, there's a lot that gets factored into that. Whereas if you're going to look at social media content, are you being educated, inspired, encouraged? Okay, maybe, but that doesn't mean that that's advice. And I think that's a key thing. I don't yes. care how big the, the voice is that's saying it. Is that actually taking into account your unique circumstances and context and lived experience and culture as a person? It can't. It just can't. So TikTok, Instagram, YouTube cannot tell you what to do ever. That's right. And we all, myself included, we have our lenses and our biases, right? Like I'm a white woman from Utah, from a religious context. Like I have my biases that I don't even know about. And if, if someone in, in Mexico is watching my videos, some of the stuff I say is culturally inappropriate to them. That's right. It's not going to be helpful. So I think, I think the biggest piece of advice I would say is like, spend some time clarifying what you want your life to be about, what you really value. And then as you watch media, um, ask yourself the question, does this empower me to take more active role in my own life and in, in living the life I care about? Or does this content um, feel very comforting or entertaining, but it makes me feel disempowered later? So content that, that does a lot of labeling, like, oh, you probably have ADHD if you crave salt. You probably have your partners a narcissist if they do this that disempowers people because it then limits their options. Oh, well now I'm broken or my person is broken. So I can either stay in a broken relationship or cut them off. And that's like limiting, limiting options where if someone's like, let me educate you on 500, 500 skills for dealing with yeah. difficult people. And that's like, oh, okay. Maybe that will empower you a little bit more. I, that's excellent advice right there. That's advice about taking your advice. Very meta. <laughs> uh, it's really good. Uh, the, and you know, we'll come back and talk about this some other time because we're kind of ran out of time. We don't want to go too long. But sure. that idea that like, does it, it disempowering me or what you use the words, is it informing me? Is it entertaining me? Mm -hmm. That's a whole topic we could probably spend another half hour on. Yeah. Using your mental health, mental health content. This is a problem I'm trying to solve or a change I'm trying to make in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm being entertained by this. It can start to skew your own perception of your yourself and the, the context that you're in. So you just got to be really careful. I, I'll offer some social media advice. Don't use, you listen to me, it's probably anxiety, but don't use anxiety or mental health content to entertain you. I don't yeah. think that's a good idea. Yeah. 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 So anyway, you want to put a bow on this? Anything else you want to throw out there before we wrap it up? Hmm. No pressure. Just no, say something. Right? <laughs> be profound on demand. I mean, I, I really believe we all have massive capability and potential to grow and learn and improve ourselves. And if we in, are intentional, we can choose content that's going to help us do that, help us see ourselves in a broader context and as more capable and, uh, and, and maybe unlock some of that. Like someone's going to teach you a little skill that's like, oh, now I have a tool. I can do something with this. And it's going to make you feel like more light, I would say, like more energy um, instead of like, I would just say, be really cautious about anything that makes you feel comforted, but unenergized. Like, oh yeah, the system's ruining me or my ADHD makes it impossible for this. And so I just have to kind of curl up. Yeah. And if you can feel that in your body. There's a difference between the type of content that makes you lift up your shoulders and like write something down and take an action and the type of content that makes you kind of curl down and be like, yeah, things yeah. do suck. Or sadly, I'll add on to this to wrap it up, mm -hmm. type of content that doesn't really motivate you to make a change or help you make a change, but does keep you pushing your thumb on the screen. Yep. Right. So like, you know, I hear it all the time. Like, I, yeah, I know. I've seen all the things. I follow all the anxiety people. I know all the things, but I can't seem to get it done. Like, okay, well, you know, you can back away from some of the content then because it's probably making you feel a little worse. So. Yeah. Please stop watching my videos at that point and um, go for a walk. See, this is why I like you, Em. I, I always say I'm the only podcast that some people have not listened to their podcast. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh, thank you so much for coming and, I, and spending some time. I appreciate it. You're welcome here anytime. And cool. Thank you so much for having me. It's a blast as, yeah. as always. So. You're very welcome. I will come back and wrap this up. But if you want to find more about Emma, just go to therapyinanutshell.com. I'll put her links in the YouTube description and the podcast notes. Thanks, Emma. Okay, we are back in the studio, which as you can see is the exact same desk and the exact same day with the exact same terrible haircut and like crappy t shirt that I had on when I was talking to Emma. So I haven't gone anywhere. I just hit the record button again. Anyway, I just want to wrap up the episode. Thank you so much again to Emma McAdam for coming on. If you want to get more information about Emma or find the content that she produces, you can hit her website at therapyinanutshell.com or search for her on YouTube, Therapy in a Nutshell. It's going to be easy to find. She has a really big channel. Uh, I will put all of her links in the YouTube video description or the podcast show notes, depending on how you're consuming this or on the uh, the, web, the blog post on my website. And uh, yeah, I think it was a great topic. The, the wrap up here would be just try to limit the amount of information you consume on social media. Ask what it is you're trying to get out of what you consume from a mental health standpoint on social media. And if you're not getting that in the feed, then you have the power and the right and, and, the, and all the tools that you need to start to unfollow or tell the algorithm you don't like it or step away and change it. Uh, you don't have to take what social media platforms give you, especially if that information is not really helping you or like Emma said, sort of like lighting a spark and encouraging and inspiring you to actually move forward. So something to consider. Uh, and if that information is not working for you and it's not helpful for you, including information that I produce and like Emma said, that she produces, unfollow me too. That's really okay. Be an advocate for yourself. Be careful how much time you're spending consuming this information and really once in a while evaluate whether or not it's helping you or maybe even helping to keep you stuck because we definitely do not want that. None of us would want that for sure. So that is episode 298 of The Anxious Truth in the books. You know it's over because the music is playing as it always is. So I'm going to remind you again that no matter how small the steps are that you take today, toward a recovered state and away from an avoidant fearful state, those steps count. Even if they're tiny little steps, even if it's just starting to consider a different way to do things instead of running from what you fear or trying to avoid or manage your symptoms, even if it's just that, that counts. All of those steps really do add up. They ultimately get you where you want to be. If you can be kind to yourself, patient with yourself and stay on the path. Of course, just a quick favor, if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, maybe subscribe to the channel, leave a comment if you have a question, hit the notification bell so you know when there are more podcast episodes and videos uploaded. And of course, if you're listening to the podcast on a platform like Apple Podcasts or Spotify that lets you write a review or or uh, leave a you know a, a rating, maybe leave the, the uh, podcast a five-star review if you dig it, or spend a second to maybe write a review if you really dig it, because it helps more people find the information and then more people get help, and that's why I do this to begin with. So thank you so much for coming by. I appreciate it. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you found it useful. Hope you come back for the next one in two weeks. Don't know what that's going to be, but I will be here. Thanks again for chilling out. And I will see you in the next episode. We are out. Mm -hmm.